HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth, where we're exploring all sorts of business topics. Experts from around the world, join me, your host, Diane Helbig, for a conversation where they share their expertise with all of you. Take what you need, when you need it. Featured on Inc.com, Forbes, and MSNBC's Your Business, this podcast is recognized as one of the best podcasts for small business, sales, leadership, social media, and more. When it comes to business, Accelerate Your Business Growth has got it covered. And now on with the show. My guest today is Diane Tarshis. Diane is a seasoned business advisor and founder of Startup Distillery. Working with entrepreneurs across the U.S. and around the globe, Diane uses her unique mix of finance, retail, manufacturing, and operations experience to help entrepreneurs distill their ideas into profitable, growing businesses. Thanks so much for joining me today, Diane. Thank you so much for having me. I am thrilled to have you here. I, uh, we were talking a little bit before uh, we started recording, and I was commenting about how much I love that name, Startup Distillery, because the visual is um, of, of helping people distill their ideas, get them down to that thing that they can actually take action on and and uh, exactly. make. Yeah, it's great. Really starting great. and starting and growing a business can be very, very overwhelming. And so um, distilling it down is really important so that you can stay focused and do what you need to do to be a, uh, turn your business into a success. So definitely. Yeah, I love that. Okay, now we're going to be talking about alternatives to scaling, but still growing, you know, to, to still grow a business. And I would love it if you would just start by clarifying the difference between scaling and growth. Absolutely. Um, Because a lot of people use them interchangeably. And that's, Uh and that's fine. Nobody, you know, the the word police is not going to come. But um, growth is when you are adding revenue at the same rate you're adding resources or, or costs. So like capital, people, etc, things that cost money. Um, And scaling is adding revenue at an exponential or faster rate relative to the rate you're adding resources or costs. So it's incremental versus exponential. So the example I like to give is imagine, um, take room and board, you know, furniture store. And if they want to grow, they have to add more stores, which involves, you know, renting or, or buying real estate, hiring more people, um, spending more on producing their furniture, hiring more delivery people. And so for each store that they open, you know, there's this set amount of costs and that's how they're able to grow. But if there were some magical new product that let's say um, magic carpets where they could snap their fingers to manufacture them and they could um, uh, snap their fingers twice to have them teleported directly into the customer's homes, then they could sell a ton more product without having to spend all this money on 
delivery and manufacturing and all this other stuff. So another way to think about it is um, uh, software companies, apps, those are very scalable because to sell a whole lot more, you don't have to spend a whole lot more. So hopefully that's clear. Yeah, I thought that was great. Thanks. So now talk to me some about the downsides of scaling. Like why would someone not want to scale? Well, there's the cost. Yeah, there's, well, you know, there's the, there are the lifestyle questions and then there are the financial questions. So um, from a lifestyle standpoint, um, and I, I fall into this group, um, I didn't, I don't want to scale my business because there are for several reasons. Well, one, I don't want to manage other people. Um, it's not something I enjoy. I would rather, uh, you know, it just adds more stress. So for me, you know, scaling equals more stress. Um, I don't want to worry about other people's livelihoods and, um, you know, it's just not for me. Um, also, I love the actual work that I do. I don't want to spend my days managing other people as opposed to working with my clients. That's the stuff that I really love. And managing people to me is just not fun. Um, and I also like learning new things, which I get to do by working on the client side. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, um, I get to set my own hours. So when you are, um, um, when you are scaling, um, everything is exponential. You are pulled in a million different directions. And uh, that is not something that I was particularly interested in. Uh, I am interested in growth, but not in scaling. Um, from a financial standpoint, when you are scaling, oftentimes that translates into needing other people's money. Um, and so that means taking on, uh, typically these days, uh, taking on outside investors. And um, there are pros and cons to that. So, um, you know, I, I would say that those are really sort of the two avenues of difference. Yeah, I'm so with you on um, not wanting uh, on the lifestyle issue. I, I don't want to be uh, to grow. And people talk to me about it all the time. You know, why don't you have you ever thought about adding more advisors and more coaches? It's like, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how, you know, so many people want you to, you know, outsiders, they, they want you to grow to this sort of imagined level that I guess the way I think about it is they're thinking more is more and I'm thinking less is more. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, if I wanted to manage other people, I would have stayed in corporate America. I, you know, I don't really want that stress. And, you know, uh, and like I said, I I'd rather do the actual work than um, manage people. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm totally with you on that one. Okay. So if I'm not going to scale, what are alternatives for growth? Um, you know, there are a number of avenues you can take. Um, so a lot of times I'll have clients who uh, will, will be, let's say, working on um, um, their list of products or services, or we'll look at, we're looking at their financials. And, um, you know, what are untapped revenue streams that uh, they could take advantage of? So. Um, I like to look at things that aren't necessarily obvious. So for example, um, I had a client uh, recently that was opening a physical therapy uh, rehab clinic uh, and they can grow by adding locations, certainly. Um, but there are these sort of untapped revenue streams that they could uh, access. So for example, they can hold in-house and off-site workshops. They can do uh, offer professional development and education for instructors and exercise professionals. Um, and they can host conferences. They can offer telehealth. Telehealth is a huge thing now, mm -hmm. thanks to the pandemic. So there are all of these opportunities that may not seem obvious, but uh, that is one example of an alternative for growth. The other is, um, another is partnerships. 
So using the same example, um, they can partner with Lululemon or I never know how to pronounce it. If it's Athleta, Athleta. Yeah, I think it's Athleta. I have no Athleta. Idea. <laughs> so uh, it's always been a mystery to me. So, um, uh, you know, they can uh, partner with, um, or, you know, with retailers like that and offer more of their services and workshops, et cetera. Um, there is a business I worked with um, that was selling men's dress socks. And they used a, a unique technology to make dress socks super comfortable, you know, athletics and with style for that's good for work. And so uh, I had them partner with Bonobos, who at the time was not selling men's socks. And hmm. so, you know, these partnerships where there's some, and I hate to use this word, but synergy, <laughs> um, uh, you know, where the... Um, the sum is greater than uh, uh, the sum of the parts or the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So um, uh, there are those kinds of opportunities. And then last but not least is um, tapping into new markets. So um, I was, you know, true to my name of startup distillery. I was working with a distillery and um, they are actually getting into the ready to drink pre-made cocktail market. Um, which when we were first talking about that, that was really not, um, uh, that was not a particularly well-known market. Um, thanks again to the pandemic, it has grown like gangbusters, but that's another story. So, or I have a, a, a client who's a, a professional that does a lot of photography um, related to, and, and it's sort of art paper-based artwork um, that she photographs uh, for illustrations. So her work's been in the New York Times and a lot of national periodicals. Uh, she works with a lot of corporations as well as like Lyft and um, other companies. She got into a whole new line of business creating subs subscription artistic kits for, um, uh, for children. And hmm. so she's got this new market where um, parents buy these activity kits for their children. So it's, it's all of this is about thinking creatively. I think that's the bottom line. That's exactly, that's so great because that's exactly what I was thinking that you have to be able to think beyond <clears throat> what your, uh, you know, what is traditional or, or, you know, what you are just used to doing. And it's, it's, I'm so glad you gave those examples because I was going to ask you um, if the if the pandemic had had an impact on this kind of thing because I know a lot of companies that had to um, get creative and look at different markets or different ways of doing the same thing uh, in order to stay in business. Absolutely. I mean, even thinking about how restaurants are, uh, you know, ha handling their quote unquote, food delivery. <laughs> so, you know, whether it was a matter of teaming up with the, um, you know, door dashes of the world, or, you know, curbside pickup, or, you know, what have you, um, some around, I'm in Chicago, and some of the restaurants around here were offering these sort of meal kits or um, fancy, uh, sort of full, full featured, uh, dinner packages where you pick it up and have these, um, you know, surf and turf and, you know, fancy dessert and whatnot, all sort of prepackaged, whereas it used and at affordable, relatively affordable prices, as opposed to being completely unattainable if you wanted to actually go to the restaurant pre-pandemic. So, yeah, everyone's kind of rethinking things. Definitely. And now that we're coming out of it, it, it lends itself to, you know, getting even more creative, really, and thinking about, all right, what are there hybrid methods? You know, what do we do now that things are starting to loosen up? Yeah, I, I think the pandemic gave the world, uh, for, forced the world to pause. And so all of us as individuals, we suddenly had all of this um, sort of quiet time on our hands. And instead of looking out 
externally at the world for what we wanted to achieve or, you know, what made us happy, what would make us happy. Suddenly we were looking more inward and, and um, sort of closer to home and what would make us happy, what would be fulfilling and satisfying. And, and that's, I sort of see that as this huge disruption in the way we think. And so there are all of these creative ideas that are people were coming up with um, new ways to do things um, or just these ideas that they'd had where they finally get to um, pursue them. And there's, you know, so many new businesses that have started during the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's really, I mean, I, I, I love seeing it now. Are there indicators that would prompt you like to advise someone to reconsider plans for scaling if, if they were thinking about scaling yeah. their business? Yeah. If somebody is thinking about scaling their business, the questions that I'm asking them are often, um, um, how, you know, do you have everything in place to be able to provide your service or produce your product um, at a greater volume, you know, what, what is that mm-hmm. going to entail? And so you have to make sure from an operational standpoint that, um, you know, that, that you can meet whatever those needs are. And then also from a financial standpoint. So as an example, I had this unusual client years ago who had a storefront and I'm doing air quotes of the word bakery, a storefront bakery. It was a meatloaf bakery. So everything, it sounds horrible, but apparently it was, it was uh, very successful where, um, and maybe I'm anti meatloaf, but um, uh, she would make cupcake, meatloaf cupcakes, and, you know, certainly the traditional meatloaf and all these different products. And she had the opportunity. She went on to QVC um, and suddenly she was getting orders from like all over. It was, it was tremendous. She got a tremendous volume of orders. And the unfortunate thing is she hadn't been working with me at that time. And so she was completely overwhelmed and had no way to produce enough to be able to fulfill those orders. So she really got herself into a pickle and then financially Um, So from a production side, she needed to be able to, you know, meet that volume, but also from a financial side, she had to spend a lot of money, a lot more money on ingredients um, and packaging and labeling uh, and labor and, uh, you know, all of these things that if we had been working together, we could have planned that out and she could have had financing in place. But Unfortunately, that wasn't the way it went down. And so uh, she came close to losing the business. Boy, beware of what you wish for, right? (laughs) Right. It sounds awesome. It's like people who get that first order from Target or Walmart and they're thrilled. And then suddenly they have to fulfill the order and they're like, holy cow, now what do I do? So. Okay. Okay. And what do they do? I mean, so, you know, you have someone who jumped into scaling sooner than they were ready to, you know, really do that um, and realize it and want to pivot, you know, like to a more manageable approach. Can they do that? Well, hopefully they don't lose their shirts and they can um, not piss off Target or Walmart. Um, That can be problematic. Uh, and they are at risk of losing their business. If they're able to, you know, to uh, fulfill the order and, and they decide that they would rather not continue at that scaled up level, um, they can take a step back. So, you know, there's a, you know, you could always make the choice to say, I want to grow, but I don't want to scale. Mm -hmm. And, Um, you know, or I only want to grow to this level. Um, You know, there's nobody standing there saying, you have to keep growing. (laughs) You know, it's your life. So you get to decide. And if you don't, if you like managing five people, but you don't like managing 50 people, 
Or if you like working with one factory, but you don't want to work with 10 factories, then, you know, it's your business. You don't have to. So you can, you can make those choices. Um, and other people's expectations shouldn't be in the equation about how you live your life. That's, that's my opinion. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you on that. I agree. You know, there's that whole feeling of, you know, what society's expectations are or keeping up with the Joneses. And mm -hmm. I, I don't subscribe to any of that. You know, life's too short. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. And I do think that, you know, since last year, people are reevaluating what really matters and, and that they don't want to be doing something just because other people think they should. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I, you know, I think it's, it, that's one of the benefits yeah um is that this whole experience has really made us evaluate you know yeah yeah i know silver lining right yeah yeah mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. whether you're a seasoned designer or a total novice with visme you can create engaging dynamic branded content that makes people ask how did you do that visit tinyurl.com slash seizevisme to explore. If you're a small business owner or salesperson who struggles with getting the sales results you're looking for, grab a copy of Succeed Without Selling on Amazon and wherever books are sold. And if you haven't seen all audible.com has to offer, you don't know what you're missing. Sign up for a free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. So uh, are there other things that people um, can take into consideration when, when they're weighing their options and trying to figure out where they want to take their company? You know, um, the financial side can also play a big role um, because, well, how do I? So, you know, you can grow by taking other people's money or you can choose to grow organically. When you take other people's money, you're also essentially taking on a boss, right? So um, that can be one of the downsides. You know, the upside is that, you know, you get this money, let's say from a, a, an angel investor or a venture capitalist, um, and um, um, perhaps they can um, um, open doors through their network, um, and perhaps they have, uh, experience that can help you, but their, their goals and their interests may not totally be aligned with yours. Um, you're also giving up some control. So they have a stake in your business and therefore they have a say, um, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of founders don't really want to do that. They want to keep the control. And so, um, they also don't want to grow too quickly so that, um, um, it harms the business in the long run. So growing organically, uh, allows you to, uh, um, grow at a more natural pace. Um, and if you can use revenues to fund your, your, that organic growth, um, so much the better, and you get to keep, um, keep control. Mm -hmm. And so those are considerations about, what the implications are for at what in terms of what rate you grow at and then where you're getting the funding in order to grow and whether you're going to um, um, be beholden to somebody else or not you know how much how much control you'll maintain over your your own company so it feels like it's potentially a slower growth but a more controlled manageable growth yeah, typically, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem that I see too frequently is that when people, um, when founders take uh, VC money or professional angel investor money, um, you know, it seems very glamorous and very sexy. And, um, and, and for some founders, that's sort of the end goal in terms of validation um, I don't subscribe to that. Um, I like to see my, my clients, uh, 
keep as much control as they can for as long as they can. Yeah. Um, and even if they decide today that they want to grow but not scale, that's not a permanent decision. In the future, they can decide they're ready to scale. Right. But but when you grow organically, it is slower. Um, it can oftentimes be better for the business. I've seen too many scenarios where the investors are um, forcing, we've all seen it with, um, who is it that's closing? I, my mind has just gone blank, but um, all of these, uh, uh, too many locations open up too quickly and the business can't sustain it. Um, you know, and that's kind of a recipe for disaster. So, yeah. you know, organic growth is more measured, more reasonable, more, cons more conservative, um, but better in the long run for the business oftentimes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally get that. I keep thinking about, as we're talking about this, I keep thinking about companies that um, scale and the founder loses connection with the people in right. the business and it becomes, you know, a more corporate environment, which is less conducive to creativity and um, ownership and loyalty and, and all of those things. Right. Plus you lose, you lose contact with your customers. Yeah. So, you know, the more distance there is between you as the founder and your custom, your, your ideal customers or your target customers, mm -hmm. uh, you start losing that sense of, uh, you know, how well, how deeply you understand their wants and needs. And that's a risk because if you don't really deeply understand your customer, then you run the risk of um, losing them in the long run. So we can talk about department stores. Yeah. Um, they used to be central to retailing. Um, nowadays, there's nothing they, you know, one isn't really differentiated from the other. Right. Do they really have different customers? I don't know. Um, but uh, I feel like they don't really understand who their customers are, as opposed to some of these smaller boutiques where they really understand, oh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going after the teenage goth market versus the, um, um, you know, surfer beach dudes um, you know, for this other, for this other retail chain. So, um, you know, you have to know who your customer is. You know, interestingly, I was, um, in a meeting, I think a couple of weeks ago, and one of the people brought up that their, their customer had decided to totally change the relationship and set up a whole bidding process. And so the vendor scheduled a, a meeting with the owner who they've known each other, you know, for they've worked together for a very long time. Anyway, turns out that the owner had no idea that any of this was going on <gasps> because she was so far removed from the day to day. Oh no. Yeah. That she didn't know that. And, and so she assured this woman who I know that, okay, no, here's who you need to talk to. This is how we're doing this. That's I mean, scary. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So she had people making decisions that were potentially detrimental to the business. Right. Because she had lost that level of connection and awareness. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's an internal structure issue, yeah. you know, yeah. in terms of reporting structure Yeah, and, uh, and yeah, that's really dangerous. I know. I know it was incredible. I mean, yeah. So, uh, apparently it's happening, you know, it happens on both sides of the table, right? Right. Yeah. Right. And you know, you really need to think about that. Yeah. Business is challenging. Gro growing is challenging. That's why they call it growing pains, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what when my sister used to say, that's why they call it work, right? Yeah. Not fun, <laughs> not play. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. True. Although I, you know, yeah. I like to have it both ways. So um, maybe I'm lucky in that I do, but it, it took a number of years to get here. So, um, but that's my wish for, uh, for everyone else. That's why I'm such a huge proponent of people starting their own businesses. Yeah. So um, I, I think there's so much upside. So. Yeah, I, I do too. As long as they're prepared and you know, yes. it's, it's in there then they understand what they're, they're in for. Right. But that's, that's why there are people like you and me. To yeah, help them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's exactly. Right. Oh my gosh, Diane, I really appreciate this information. I think it's so important for people to slow down and take a real, um, serious investigative look at what they want for their company and the different ways they can get there. And then, so they can make an informed decision about what the best way is for them. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. Really great. Thank you so much for sharing this and for being here with me. And so will you tell the listeners how they can find you and. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Mm. Us Dianes have to stick together. Right. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and people can find me at uh, startupdistillery.com. Um, particularly startupdistillery.com slash services is probably the best link. Um, and you can also find my phone number there and give me a call. So uh, I don't stand on ceremony. I love the surprise phone calls. Excellent. So you heard it here, right? Heard it here first. That's the, the best way to do it. So that's great. Thank you so much for, I mean, I learned a lot. And so I know the listeners did. So, well, thank you so much. It was Absolutely. great to be here. Absolutely. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, a production of Evergreen Podcasts. Discover more episodes of this podcast and explore others at evergreenpodcast.com. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And if you're looking to get your sales strategy headed in the right direction, pick up a copy of Succeed Without Selling on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. The world's best-known investor and Wall Street expert Warren Buffett once said, Wall Street is the only place that people ride to in a Rolls Royce to get advice from those who take the subway. Mr. Buffett's quote is remarkably accurate, but how many people would rather receive advice from him than someone simply guessing? Welcome to Buy, Hold, Sell, your single source for Wall Street knowledge and profitable guidance. Please join me, Todd Schoenberger, and fellow trader Tobin Smith, as well as host Veronica Dudo, for a podcast known to move the needle for investors. Tobin and I are seasoned Wall Street executives with deep investment experience, and we are prepared to share our advice to those who choose to listen. Download Buy, Hold, Sell today on the Evergreen Podcast Network or your favorite podcast channel.